You're listening to the Legal Talk Network. Hello, I'm Monica Bay. And I'm Bob Ambrogi. We've been writing about law and technology for more than 30 years. That's right. During that time, we've witnessed many changes and innovations. Technology is improving the practice of law, helping lawyers deliver their services faster and cheaper. Which benefits not only lawyers and their clients, but everyone. And moves us closer to the goal of access to justice for all. Tune in every month as we explore new legal technology and the people behind the tech. Here on Law Technology Now. Welcome to Law Technology Now on the Legal Talk Network. This is Bob Ambrogi, and today we're speaking with Graham Smith Bernal, the founder of Opus 2 International. Well, he was still in his early 20s. Graham founded the UK's largest court reporting agency, which he later sold for over 15 million pounds. He then invented LiveNote, which was the world's first court reporting and evidence management software. In 2007, he sold LiveNote to Thomson Reuters for over $70 million. Following a brief retirement to his estate in Umbria, Italy, Smith Bernal returned to the market in 2008 to found the company he currently runs, Opus 2 International. Graham, welcome to uh, Law Technology Now. Thanks, Bob. Graham, I wanted to start by just talking a little bit about your background and how you got started. Uh, I had read that you actually left school at the age of 16 and and became a court reporter. Tell us about that. Yeah, well, it was... um I think uh, conventional education, uh, now I look back on it, wasn't really my thing. Um, I was a bit of a rebel, I suppose. Um, I've got some strong views about education now with hindsight, um, but we won't go into those. Uh, I was going to join my father's company. Uh, he was uh, ran a, a pretty successful marketing uh, promotion handling business. And then I suddenly discovered this uh, the, this court reporting course, uh, and it was the first course in England that was set up where um, the stenograph machine was being taught, and I had a go at becoming a stenographer, and I was pretty good at it. And then I, I qualified, uh, and at the age of 23, I suddenly had an opportunity to set my own company up. A combination of circumstances led to that. I, I took the plunge and set up Smith Banal International and um, always had an interest in technology, always had an open mind to the fact that these industries, that, you know, such as court reporting, the legal industry itself, were very traditional precedent-driven industries that were driven more by how things were done in the past rather than how things might be done in the future. Um, had an interest in technology. Started invoking technology uh, that increased the efficiency of uh, producing transcripts, computer aided transcription technology. Uh, I brought in a, a product called Discovery ZX back in the, the late 80s, early 90s, which uh, allowed you to have transcripts on, a, on disk and then you could search, etc. And then um, with the advent of real time transcription, when it became possible for stenographic code to instantly be translated into English text, I came up with the idea of LiveNote. Um, which would allow you to access a transcript as, it, as the evidence was happening um, and interact with, with the evidence, making notes, marking it up, etc. So LiveNote was very much actually something that I brought into, into, um, into existence in the latter half of my ownership of Smith Banal. And um, we used, uh, one of the things I learned very early on was how to use technology not only as a way of improving efficiency and saving time, saving lawyers valuable time and money, um, but also understanding how to use technology as a differentiator, as a, a differentiator between myself and the competition. So LiveNote was something we created and brought to market initially in the UK as a service differentiator. In other words, give me your court reporting business and I'm going to give you a live transcript and here's how it works. Did people understand the value of that at the time that you started providing it? I mean, were, were lawyers jumping all over that, or were they saying, why do I need this? Well, in the early days, it, we weren't meeting a demand. It wasn't as if we were yeah. creating something and saying, and people were saying, look, we want to have live transcripts. Right. You know, I basically took a, a punt that if it was possible to do this, then eventually the market would say, well, this makes so much sense. The key to it all was it had to be easy. Lawyers don't like using technology. A lot of them are technophobic, particularly in the UK. And I recognized the only way we would get, you know, a 70-year-old judge with a wig on his head to use a computer hands-on was to make it easy. So 
you know, it had to be simple. We developed from day one in, in the Windows interface. Uh, that meant something to me. This is 1990, 91. It was the world's first, you know, there was no Windows technology in those days. Yeah. But, and I had people around me saying, you know, Windows is never actually going to happen. That's only ever going to be a toy. Right. Fortunately, I didn't listen to them um, because it made sense. You know, I needed to get these judges and lawyers to use the computer hands on. And um, Windows made so much sense because of simplicity. So we had a lot of pushback um, in the early days, a lot of reticence. But once we were able to show how easy it was to achieve a significant benefit with a very insignificant learning curve, suddenly these judges and lawyers said, you know, I need this. And plus, they then said, this is great, but what if you could do this, that, and the other? So we effectively designed the product from day one on the back of its practical usage, leveraging the input of the end user in terms of what it should do next. Within three years, LiveNote had become a virtual standard on major litigation in the UK. We won various awards in the legal space. And that really you know, resulted in the product becoming not only mature as a, as a product, as a piece of technology, but mature in terms of the usage in the marketplace. So effectively, it was a classic example of cross-pollination, if you like. The technology resulted in my service business becoming the leading service provider in the sector um, you know, within five, six years. And it flipped the other way. Suddenly, the fact that I was covering all these major hearings and trials resulted in the technology becoming an industry standard. And so you, at some point, flipped from your focus on the service business to the focus on the technology. And exactly. And, and that's really when we came to the States. 95 was the first time 95. I came. The product was a fairly mature product at that point. The market in America was still sort of getting its feet wet, if you like, with Windows technology. It was, you know, there was still a lot of you know, a legacy technology out there from the old world. And you know, we effectively replicated the proven strategy of getting service providers. We weren't trying to set up a service business ourselves in the UK, but getting all the leading court reporting firms initially to provide LiveNote as a differentiator to their court reporting service. You know, the, the ability for lawyers then on depositions, very much centric to the deposition environment rather than trials. Um, but you know, lawyers could then have access to the live testimony as it was happening, interact with uh, their co-counsel who might even be sitting remotely, that sort of thing. And then, again, once you know, lawyers started using it, the law firms themselves became interested in using the technology beyond just as a real-time transcript tool. And within two to three years, we had had probably 80, 90% of the top 200 law firms invoking LiveNote as an enterprise solution for managing all transcripts, all the key exhibits in the case, and even video. That was, I mean, we're going to talk more about the state of digital technology in the courtroom now, but I'm trying to think back to 1995, and that was a, a pretty early time still in the evolution of that kind of technology. What was kind of the state of stenographic technology as of the time that you came over here in 19, 1995? Well, the, the actual stenographic technology, the CAT, what's called the computer-aided transcription technology that translates stenographic code into English, had all been developed in the States. All we did was create a, a tool that resided on a lawyer or a judge's terminal and received, irrespective of which computer-aided transcription system was being used, allowed um, them to work, um, you know, in an open environment, dependent, you know, irrespective of what the system was. So the, the technology was pretty mature. I think, you know, a lot of things were happening in parallel. There was, um, you know, processing speed on computers was becoming faster. So the translation time from the stenographic code to the text appearing on your screen got quicker, less delays, um, more robustness in terms of storage, um, stuff like that. So it's success in any business is about timing as much as anything else, as well as the process through which you bring it to bear. And, you know, the timing was right about the mid-90s. I think the market started to open its mind to the graphical user interface, Windows technology. So, you know, we were we were probably slightly ahead of the curve, um, but very quickly, you know, we, we found ourselves in the right place. Yeah, I think it was also driven at that point by just, just the growth in kind of litigation teams, essentially. I mean, it seems that dur certainly during my career, the way law firms handle litigation has changed significantly, only in that they have gone from a, co a couple of lawyers at the table to uh, huge teams, some of them at the table, some of them back in the home office, some of them up and sitting in the corporate counsel's uh, office. Uh, all following closely what's going on, and I'm sure that helped drive the evolution of, of and the acceptance of, of your technology. Well, it did, um, and we did get, you know, increasingly, you know, certainly from the year 2000 onwards, more and more frequently, we would actually see 
live note hearings, depositions, trials taking place with not only attendees at the hearing, but increasingly remote attendees as well. I think that also brings one on to where we are now. You know, the, f the future technology is mm. the cloud and, and the ability to access uh, and collaborate and share is so much it's exponentially easier and greater the power is uh, is in this modern world that we're now in and, yeah. and that's really you know where our new technology where you is are now well so in 2007 you sold live note to i said thompson reuters but was it thompson reuters then or was it still thompson at that point? well it, it's a strange on that it was thompson and two months later they bought reuters okay. after they bought our company so it was thompson reuters so right after at that, that point and uh retired to your estate in Umbria, Italy, and uh, what in the world drew you out of <laughs> Umbria, Italy to start uh, uh, another company? Well, I was getting fat <laughs> all that pasta. Um, <laughs> Sounds good. The, the vino was good as well. Um, and, you know, I, I had a good time. I think that the great thing was I was actually involved, even in, during my retirement, in another uh, cloud-based technology product called iSight which was a um, web research management tool that took off quite significantly in the academic space. Uh, the problem with the academic space is two things. One is students uh, have no product loyalty. If they see something better and cheaper coming along, they'll move to it. And secondly, they have no money. <laughs> have no money <laughs> That's a big so, one. So that was a big problem. So I, I effectively, you know, that experience taught me a little bit about um, the potential of the cloud and you know some of the issues as well i mean the issues then as facing the legal community were paranoia about security about accessibility um etc um so those were definitely issues that needed to be addressed when, when moving into a cloud world but i think that what moved me was the ideas that i got from that experience of being involved in eyesight and secondly you know i was 48 when i sold live note and at this point, when I, you know, started having these ideas about the next generation of technology, I, I just turned 50, and I just thought, you know, this is great fun living here in Italy, but you know, I could still be doing that and building a new business. Yeah. Um, and so, that's when I set up Opus Two, and effectively, we we started developing the world's first collaborative cloud platform for managing litigation content, which was our Magnum platform. But the secret sauce, if you like, was we replicated that proven strategy from LiveNote of bringing that technology to bear as a service differentiator for my, um, effectively, what was a new core reporting business, the Opus 2 international reporting business. You know, we started developing this platform. Uh, we had built a development team in Scotland and Edinburgh. Um, two guys headed that who are you know, some of the brightest minds in computer science in, in the UK. And um, we first expose our Magnum technology, perhaps just five, six months after we started developing the code, to the parties involved in the abramovich Berezovsky trial, which was the world's biggest private litigation back in, I think it was 2011. And very early on, the judge saw this, this technology. This was a case involving two main parties, three third parties, something like 40, 50,000 key documents in the case that had been, you know, sorted and culled from the original document sets. And, you know, we were talking 250 lever arch files of documents times five or six sets in the courtroom. So that effectively, there wouldn't have been a courtroom big enough to hold that, that yeah. type of documentary, uh, that volume. Um, and the judge saw this, this technology and how easy it was to use. And she basically said to the parties, we need to use this. So that case effectively became not a totally paperless trial, but we saved something like five million pieces of paper on that hearing back in 2011. So Opus 2 is both like your prior company had been a, a service company and a product company, a technology company, I guess. And Magnum is the platform. Is that, that's what you call the platform. So break it down for me. We say it's a, it's a collaboration platform. What exactly does it do? Okay, so first and foremost, it's a product just like LiveNote that's specifically designed and developed for use by lawyers. It actually replicates what lawyers do when they're actually working with key documents in the case. The litigation process, whether you're in the UK or the US, is, is, can be divided for me into two sections. What goes on in what I call the engine room of the ship, which is you know the sorting, the, the processing, the culling of the documents, and then the point at which the lawyers get involved 
uh, and some of that is happening early on as well. But lawyers don't work with tools like Relativity and you know these doc and review products. Right. There, so that's the e-discovery. That's side the e-discovery of document. And e-disclosure, as you would call it. E-disclosure. Yeah. So, and this is very much what we've created is is something that is takes it f- from the point where you found all the key documents. Normally in America, you know, you're now preparing for deposition. Yeah. You're taking depositions. We come in at that point. Normally, everything's being reduced to paper at that point, right. and and people are sending emails out with links saying to their clients, "What do you think of this?" Whatever. So effectively, what it is is one seamless, secure platform for taking all litigation content, the transcripts, the exhibits in America, the video, plus all the work product that is created by the lawyers. So. As I say, effectively what it does, it replicates what lawyers do. They want to mark, read documents, they want to access them, and they want to be able to mark the documents up, make notes. And the default is the annotation is personal to them, but they can easily share with anyone else securely in their team, irrespective of where they are in the world. And it takes it right through to the trial of that, uh, you know, in that one interface. Do I have to be a court reporting customer of Opus 2 to be using the Magnum platform? No. Outside of America, Magnum is provided as a service from Opus 2 International. So we've, again, incubated, nurtured, developed the technology as part of a service, which has resulted in the product uh, developing its level of maturity that it has uh, and its its nuanced uh, features and functionality, such as you know granular hyperlinking and stuff like that. But in America, it's it's available um, in two ways. One is uh, law firms. We have offices in San Francisco and New York. Law firms are invoking it on a SaaS basis, case by case, um, where irrespective of who they've been using for court reporting, for the depositions, they basically use this as their centralized collaborative repository. And then what then has happened is law firms have seen not only the comprehensive functionality, the features, the simplicity, the accessibility, the power of the technology, they've now are moving towards an enterprise, invoking it on an enterprise basis across the firm. So they will pay an annual license fee to have that product as their product of choice for managing all litigation content. And effectively, it replaces products like, you know, Live Note, West Case Notebook, Case Map. We have, you know, a chronology tool inside there. It's effectively one seamless interface for everything beyond what you do in the relativity world. Does it go up through and including presentation of evidence at trial? Uh, we have that component as well. Um, it's more designed for use because just about everything goes to trial. We don't have a deposition process in England, so it's more suited to the trial process there. Um, but we have it being used here in, in the U.S. at trial. Far less cases go to trial, as you know, right. here in the U.S. It tends to be resolved after the deposition. Right. So. so in a case like the, the Abramowitz one where you said the judge basically said to the different parties in the case, I want you to use this, is there cross communication through the platform among different sides of a case? Can they have their isolated silos of information, yeah. but also be able to share and collaborate across, you know, opposing parties? Yeah, I th- the way it's set up is, I mean, we positioned our business to be a neutral service provider. So effectively, you know, parties in the UK may be using uh, one uh, e-discovery service provider, you know, on one side of the case and somebody else on the other. Effectively, we're the chessboard, at which point the parties will bring all the key documents into our world, and we act neutrally because we're also going to be working with the judge, and it's important that we retain that neutrality. The documents, what is called the trial bundle in the UK that's agreed between the parties, is uploaded into our, our system, into the Magnum system, and each side then has what is called its own private mirror. There is no ability or potential for contamination between one side's work product across all the key documents and and side B or side C and of course the judge or the arbitrators in in the matter. So it works in in quite a unique way that there's one set of documents that on a daily basis is being added to and then it spawns out if you like into the private mirrors so each side then gets a copy of that on which they can annotate, make notes, uh, tag and and, uh, hyperlink documents and collaborate. That's basically how it works. Does the court access the platform as well. Yes. The, the well, by the court, we mean the judge. Yeah, uh, but the judge, the judge's clerk, however yeah, that might be. Yeah. In England, certainly, there's no real need for the clerk to access it, but he, they, they could do. But effectively, the, the judge himself will have, you know, one workspace, a mirror of those 
uh, of the core set of documents. And of course, in an arbitration world, you know, you have three arbitrators. One of the great components of this technology is the arbitrators now have, irrespective of where they may be uh, in between hearings, one in Singapore, one in Canada, one in England or whatever, they can continuously collaborate and share their thoughts across, you know, the documents as they're being uh, or submissions or evidence or whatever it might be. So you've written a lot about the evolution. What, what you talk about is the, uh, the electronic courtroom, and you often, I think, in, in, what, in your own writing and in, in, on your company's website, from what I've seen, this, you look at that Abramowitz trial as kind of a, a turning point in the UK uh, in terms of what you see as the evolution of the electronic courtroom. What, what's happened in the UK since that trial? How is this technology evolving? Well, it's now being used probably on about 90% of all major hearings in the UK, arbitrations. Really? So it's it's almost used universally now on the mega trials. And almost ubiquitous. It, it is, yeah. And and it's because of that, you know, when it comes to arbitration, it's spawning beyond uh, the UK shores because arbitration is something that, you know, moves all over the place. Yeah. I think in terms of the... Um, you know, what the technology is now doing, I'll give you a few examples in just three to four years of some of the features and the benefits of the technology. So a normal setup, you will have, you know, two sides to a hearing. Um, we provide not only court reporters, but the trial presentation uh, officer. So effectively, a lawyer will call out a document, bundle five, page 300. Instantly, the documents coming up on the big screens. In you addition, have somebody sitting in the, in the we, hearing we, or in the actually in the hearing, there, yeah, and that person's also responsible for supporting users and making sure that they don't have issues. A lot of the cases we're involved with um, involve interpreters. Uh, we provide simultaneous real-time interpreting services with you know the the booths and stuff. So that's all happening as well. Oh. All of this technology is designed to speed up and increase efficiency of the trial. Meanwhile, the, the lawyers, uh, as individual users, they could look at the large monitor to see the document that's being referred to, but they also have um, either their own notebook or PC or even a tablet device. Most of the law firms involved have been preparing the case in Magnum, um, you know, some months before, making notes of key documents, sharing notes with other people in their team, their clients, whoever. And instantly, without the lawyer touching the computer, as a document is being pulled up on the large screen, their personal version of the document comes up on their computer with their notes, with their without notes. them having to do anything. Wow. It's, it's all there for them. So they can then continue to look at the plain vanilla document or actually look at it with their notes or notes that have been shared with them, uh, including hyperlinked documents. That's the next thing. Well, the real really powerful. I'm, I'm from the era of shuffling through piles <laughs> of paper. Yeah, so it, I think it's, it's about bringing what people have done before um, the trial in preparation and cementing that to actually what goes on in the trial process. In addition, you have the live transcript coming up, perhaps on an extended monitor. As a document is being referred to in the hearing, so page 315 of bundle four, instantly that document is hyperlinked into the transcript. So that means, you know, at any point, you can just scroll back to that point or search on that point and just click and you will actually see this is what the witness is saying about this document and here's my notes on that document. Um, so all of that's very cool. I think we talked earlier about the remote access and collaboration from, you know, clients who are sitting in you know, different parts of the world, so co-counsel. Yeah. yeah, that is something, again, that's, you know, is so much easier to do in, in the cloud world. Um, so we actually have hearings now where people, even back to the Abramovich trial, we had people sitting in Moscow in New York who would be, you know, from uh, supporting the law firm at the hearing, co-counsel, whoever it might be, or the client, and they would be accessing the live transcript, it comes up instantly. They have no need to have any software loaded on their end at all. They have no documents loaded on their end, but they literally have the transcript with a link to the document as it's referred to. So they're getting through, access... Just through a browser-based interface? Just through a browser, yeah. So they're getting access to the transcript and the key documents without having anything happening locally, and they can chat and collaborate uh, with their uh, counsel or support team in the hearing. Is this all browser-based, or are the parties using this in the courtroom? Do they have a special software on their computer? It's, it's all browser-based. We have a local server in the courtroom just in case there's an issue with access to the Internet. We have that um, as a backup. That talks seamlessly to the cloud the version. So the people in the hearing will actually have you know, something running from a server in the courtroom. In the evening, the transcripts, the exhibits are uploaded to the cloud version, and they talk seamlessly to each other so that the users can access you know, their work product and the documents and the transcripts, et cetera, you know, of that day's proceedings from anywhere. 
Yeah. Um, so it's it's a it's a hybrid in some ways, but we use that just in case there's a, a an outage uh, yeah. in the courtroom. And now again, you you've talked about the evolution of this into Asia Pacific region and then into the United States. Are the applications in Asia Pac different than what you've described in terms of what's going on in the UK? Is it more arbitration based, or is it uh, what's happening there? Well, Singapore is rapidly becoming the hub of cross-border litigation and dispute in, in the Asia-Pacific region. I think logistically it's, it's so well-placed. You've got a, a political system there that's not you know, potentially going to be slightly biased against you or whatever. I think that's one of the issues people have with Hong Kong and the Chinese taking over, etc. And, of course, you have a government that is very dynamically supporting the private sector, supporting innovation. And... Um, you know, it does tend to be there's a very um, uh, sophisticated arbitration facility there in Singapore. It does tend to be arbitration, although we are, you know, seeing take up in court hearings as well of the technology. It's a very similar process to what happens in the UK. Um, you know, it, again, it's, they don't have a deposition process like you have here. First chance each side gets to test the other side's key witnesses is actually when they're on the stand. So, you know, it's a little bit behind what's happening in the UK, but it's rapidly catching up. Uh, in terms of invoking technology. I have to guess that when we turn to the U.S., we're, we're a few steps further behind. Well, I, I think the court system, the trials, is, is a little bit behind here in, for two reasons. One is a lot actually happens way before the trial process, as we already said. You know, 95% of cases settle before you know, they get to the courtroom after the deposition process. I think the other thing is the courtroom environment here, state and federal courts, is a fairly bureaucratic environment. Most courts providing reporting services, et cetera, they are government employees. That's yeah. not an environment which lends itself to bringing new technology to bear. Right. So that's another reason it's slower. Um, our focus here is very much on the deposition um, process in, in the U.S. And, and positioning our technology to, to become you know, the dominant uh, player in that space. My view is that the deposition process is something that places like Singapore and Britain would benefit from. You know, yeah. there's so much wastage, you know, by the fact that, you know, you don't actually get to see the testimony of the other side's witnesses in, until you actually get to trial. I think the deposition process is something we should see on our shores. So in that sense, I think America's ahead. Yeah, but, and it um, works the same way in a deposition in the sense that you're getting a live transcript, you're seeing your notes as opposed to the documents that are being discussed. And I mean, pretty much the same it, scenario you described. It's very similar. In the you know, would yes, be. and remote access. Um, I think there's one very significant breakthrough with this technology in the cloud for the very first time. Video, just about every deposition that's um, taken has a videographer present. Mm -hmm. And... Um, for the first time, that video is not only manageable because it's now managed on some very cheap, you know, remote, um, secure space, um, but it's accessible. You know, in the old days, you'd have law firms storing five, six hundred days of deposition testimony synced to the video on their servers. But, you know, once a lawyer goes away from his office, he can't access that. Um, so we actually have cases now where we have hundreds of days of transcripts, hyperlinked exhibits and synchronized video all hosted in this secure cloud environment with teams of lawyers able to access a full multimedia record from any computer device anywhere in the world securely and then collaborate across all of that. So effectively, when you're searching in a transcript, you're reading it, you're marking it up, you're actually creating a video clip that you can then share right from the annotation with anyone else in your team anywhere in the world. Wow. So that's a real breakthrough, you know, the yeah. video side of things. What's the value proposition here? I mean, how does the cost of using your service compare to the cost of traditional transcription court reporting services? I'm assuming it's going to be something more than the, the standard what the traditional cost would think, be, and, and yeah. if so what, what justifies that, that extra cost? And again, we're talking about two different models here, what goes on in the UK outside of the shores yeah. of America where this technology is invoked, and then in the States. I think the first thing I'd like to say is it's scalable, totally scalable. Obviously, the cost involved on a, a case like the Abramovich matter uh, and several of the big cases we're involved with since involving lots of parties, lots of users, lots of documents is significantly greater than a, a small case involving just two lawyers and, and you know, yeah. and that's it. Yeah. You've got less documents, less cost of getting the documents in there and we charge less in terms of user charges. Yeah. So 
So, so is it a storage based charge or the, the uh, in the US data? it's very much we charge um, we don't actually charge storage we actually charge fee for you know uploading and supporting the lawyers in the uploading process and then we charge so much a month per user which comes down to about 100 bucks per user per month and then again if it's a large matter then you know there are price reductions it can come down to about 50 bucks per user per month so um, effectively you know, what lawyers are doing is they're saying, well, look, there's some additional cost here, right? But look at the savings that we're getting. Yeah. Um, you know, in terms of we're getting, you know, the ability to access documents, the time saved and not having to print lots of copies out uh, to manage that. And I think overall it's the increased efficiency, lawyering efficiency, the fact that people can now access, the client can now participate more so in the whole process than ever before. I think those are the real, um, and some of that's intangible in terms of what price do you put on that. But, you know, and ultimately the technology is now being used so much is the market saying, look, the, the benefits do significantly exceed the increase in cost. Yeah. Um, and of course there are massive cost savings. A lot of them are indirect. So that's, that's effectively where we're at. Yeah. Is your uh, typical user, I mean, for much of the time I've been listening to you today, I'm kind of picturing the litigator who's going to use this service, and I'm thinking bigger firm, bigger case. You just mentioned smaller firms in smaller cases. So where is your sort of sweet spot in terms of the target user? For I, th I think it's very easy to illustrate the savings unequivocal savings and efficiencies on the big cases there's no question that's that's a you know game over event sort of thing um, the efficiency just translates yes to and the savings like the cost savings the fact you've just got one central set of documents stored and all the work product that goes with it yeah. and, and all the exhibits and the video etc you know makes a lot of sense and then yeah. you just pay per usage of course you can pass the costs on per matter to the client and the client's happy as well so that's that's click on i think we are seeing certainly in the UK and maybe here in the States, I'm not so familiar, but more often than not, we're now getting smaller law firms involved in mega litigation. They're actually, you know, that, that's, that's something that's happening all the time. They don't have the in-house resources of practice support teams, etc., teams of paralegals. So, you know, the fact that they really are embracing this technology with open arms because it actually means it's possible for them to now, now to compete on that stage. So... I think on smaller mid-sized cases, uh, you know, law firms increasingly who are using this on the big case, they become familiar with how it works. Uh, they become slick, if you like. I use the analogy of the old world of lawyering is a bit like going around in a horse and cart. And now we have a motor car and in the early versions of the motor car were not easy to drive. And, you know, and if you crashed it, you might have killed yourself. But it's really now quite automated. It's very easy to go from A to B in a much faster time than you ever did before. So once lawyers actually master the driving of the car, very quickly that becomes the norm and, and they, they leave the horse and cart behind. So, Well, on that note, we're <laughs> that's a, a good spot, I think. We're just about out of time for the show. But I, I actually, before we conclude, I did want to just kind of throw it open to you if there was anything else in terms of the trends you're seeing in, in the evolution of the electronic courtroom or litigation technology in general primarily here in the United States, that you wanted to just allude to? I think one of the things we're working uh, more and more with, a lot of the cases and, and the big international arbitrations we're involved in involve multiple languages. You've got either a, a matter that's coming out of South America, that the native tongue is Spanish. Mm -hmm. You've got Spanish lawyers involved. We've actually had several cases where we're doing the sort of simultaneous translation. And one of the things we're actually working on now is um, the ability to have cross-language collaboration, not just, you know, in terms of basically across the documents in a case. So the idea, as I say, we have a number of cases where, you know, we'll have a trial set of documents where one document is the Spanish original document and the next document that sits next to it is the translation of that document in English. The English lawyers are working or the English client are working on the English translation. Meanwhile, the Spanish lawyers or the witnesses are working on the Spanish. And what we're looking at is a situation where it's possible for an annotation that's being made by a, a lawyer on a document in English then uh, appears on that document translated in Spanish. Yeah. So, you know, so effectively you're, you're eliminating the need for Spanish people. It's particularly useful on complex matters, you know, of uh, pharmaceutical matters yeah. or industrial uh, litigation, 
where the subject matter is complex and the Spanish witness or the, the client wants to understand it in Spanish and not yeah. try and have to read English to understand what's going on. So right. we're working on that. Yeah. And I think we're just going to get more of the same. You know, we're going to get, uh, as we get more people using this type of technology, the best way to develop the technology going forward is to actually leverage the feedback and the input from the end user. So, yeah. and it's not just about, oh, now we can do this or that. It's actually, we can do certain things better yeah. um, and more efficiently and, and do it in a way that replicates what lawyers want to do rather than actually forcing lawyers to have to change their methods, change the ways they work um, to accommodate the technology. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. The language issue is a, is a common one that comes up also in the e-discovery space now. Again, with big cases, global cases, where you're getting documents in from all over the world in any number of different languages. And as you're kind of focusing more on the discovery part of it, the, the deposition part of it, is there a point at which you start to bridge from the e-discovery phase of the trial to the whatever you would call yourself, the tri basically you're at the trial phase, you're at the, the post-discovery yeah. uh, phase. It, at some point, does your technology somehow bridge those two phases? Well, I think, again, that I divide technology into two parts. There's what is, and we talked about this already, you know, what is used in the engine room of the ship and then what yeah. is used on the bridge of the ship yeah. by the lawyers. Uh, that's where we sit. You know, one of the key reasons for my success with LiveNote and then likewise here with Magnum is that we're not trying to be all things to all men. Um, I think the worst thing these you know software companies can do once they get a build up a head of steam and they start building up momentum and market share is they start trying to be everything for everyone. Right. And that's never the way to go. Yeah. Um, so we believe in a best of breed philosophy where we basically focus on what we do and we do it really well. And then we create the technical and commercial hooks to other products. So in this case, you know, we are relativity partners. So we have that technical bridge to relativity. We recognize that. And also I connect and, and other products ringtail. Yeah. Um, so the idea is that, you know, once I finish doing what I'm doing in that world, I can just press a button and all the key documents or, you know, certain key documents with the metadata, et cetera, then find their way into, into the Magnum world. And um, that really is what it needs to be all about. You know, the, the open system approach and not trying to be that monolithic everything for everyone. Makes a lot of sense. Well, Graham Smith-Barnell, thank you very much for taking the time to be with us today. Really been a pleasure to talk with you. And you, Bob. Thank you. If you'd like more information about what you've heard today, please visit LegalTalkNetwork.com. Subscribe via iTunes and RSS. Find us on Twitter and Facebook. Or download our free Legal Talk Network app in Google Play and iTunes. The views expressed by the participants of this program are their own and do not represent the views of, nor are they endorsed by, Legal Talk Network, its officers, directors, employees, agents, representatives, shareholders, and subsidiaries. None of the content should be considered legal advice. As always, consult a lawyer.